A practice called the Oklahoma Connection has caused several popular liquor distributors to pull their products off of Oklahoma liquor shelves. The distributors won on guarantees from Oklahoma wholesalers that they wouldn't undersell the distributors in other states. A lower court had ruled the distributors couldn't require those promises. But the Supreme Court ruling today implies that Oklahoma laws are for the benefit of Oklahomans, not for out-of-state wholesalers. Alcoholic Beverage Control Director Richard Crisp says the distributors will probably find the decision encouraging. They are very desirous of returning to the state of Oklahoma. They uh, hesitated to pull out of Oklahoma, but they felt they couldn't live with a situation as it was, and that was that a monumental amount of their goods were being shipped uh, outside the state of Oklahoma, and it was upsetting their markets in, the, uh, in those states. So, yes, I, f I feel uh, certain uh, that based on this decision, there will be those that, uh, and uh, if not all, will be desirous of coming back into Oklahoma to sell their goods. The now, inavailability of the products in Oklahoma has caused prices to rise in surrounding states. One liquor retailer says the decision today could lead to a drop in liquor prices. It should bring the prices down across the board on premium items. I know it will in this store, and if this store has anything to do with the setting of the uh, market, it, it, the whole market will come down because everybody's going to have to compete. The owner of this store says that when the companies that have pulled out of Oklahoma start coming back, he's going to have to expand to make more room for them. Richard Crisp says that if everything goes right, those companies should be back on the shelves within 45 to 60 days. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. of that, I say Oklahoma prices are coming down and you can figure the prices in the five surrounding states will have to follow. The Oklahoma City School District takes in an area of over 180 square miles. The various buildings within the educational system serve over 41,000 students. School officials feel many of those buildings are in need of capital improvements, and the only way those can be done is by passage of the upcoming school bond proposal. Tonight, Dr. Tom Paisant went before the League of Women Voters in Oklahoma City to lobby for their support in the March election. It's been 13 years since we've had a bond issue in Oklahoma City and we've had a lot of major work on our buildings that has been deferred because of lack of resources and the only way we're going to get that done is to have bond issue money. We can't possibly do it out of our operating budget and this is the, the real need that's there. If it passes, Paisant says the average homeowner would be taxed around two and a half dollars a month for the next 10 years. The recent tragedy at Star Elementary has spotlighted the physical condition of many schools in the Oklahoma City area. It just may be the catalyst that will work for the passage of the upcoming school bond election. Carol Lambert, Action 4. She's now 18 years old. She wrote uh, in her statement night and pulling his pants down. All right, will you proceed? Drugs ran freely on the Whitaker campus. One of the recreation workers, Terry, regularly sold the boys liquor and drugs, marijuana, acid, speed, mollies, and most popular of all, LSD. I don't mistake my in intentions what to any degree because if any of this type of nonsense is going on it needs to be stopped way before yesterday and as rapidly as possible but but here again it, it seems to be so one-sided we had uh, Mrs. Halbert saying that uh, there was fights and beatings and somebody else said uh, that there was drugs and and one said that they were undressed and fondled or whatever um, 
what are their statements? I mean, we're only hearing one side, and if that's the correct side, so be it, but it seems, seems a little incomplete to me. State children's homes like the one in Taft have been the object of allegations that have led to a probe of the entire state system. Stories have surfaced of physical and sexual abuses and drug and prostitution rings. But other students have come forward with their own accounts of stabbings and fights, and supervisors using only the force required to restrain the offenders. Annette McGuffey was a student in six state institutions for a five and a half year period. She said she never heard of or saw the alleged abuses. She says the system was good for her. I like the system. It helped me out a lot. I really don't know why these people are talking about tasks so bad because they do their best in any way to help you as long as you want to help yourself. If a house parent restricts you as they say, they only restrict you because you have done something wrong. And the students just don't seem to realize that. But from the time I was up there until the time that I left, I did not see anything going on. I did not hear of anything going on. Apparently there are some questions that some girls up at Taft might have been operating a prostitution ring. Um. I've never even heard of that either. McGuffey says the students got drugs from outside the home, and the charges that employees supplied them were as shocking to her as to anyone else. Charles Schnetzer, Action 4. You have a system that's out of sight and out of mind and low on the priority list and it's operated in a closed-in system where the parties that are the professionals that ought to be involved in the input and design of the system don't have enough access to it and don't have real power in terms of making something happen. And you have kids in large congregate institutions out in isolated rural areas uh, which are general custodial institutions because you have to take a whole variety of people rather than really focus in on a certain type of treatment. That's what's going to happen because you're going to have employees that as a result of all that are uh, sometimes poorly paid, poorly trained. It, it just it tends to de degenerate. That's what happens in institutional care in juvenile justice. It happens in institutional care in mental health. It happens in corrections. And the only way you get around it is by trying to you know, design a real professional, uh, open-ended process and system uh, which, you know, addresses each of these issues as, in, as a systems issue. Flames and smoke were visible from the highway that runs past the OG&E Bell Isle power plant. The facility is no longer used as a generating station and workers were dismantling the holding tanks at the site. Sparks from a burning torch ignited oil residues in the bottom of the tank. Fire officials say they weren't concerned about explosions. 
The tank contained the blaze, but it was open at the top and on the sides. Enough pressure couldn't build up for an explosion to occur. The tanks were being dismantled for sale as scrap steel, and so investigators say there was no significant damage from the blaze. Half a dozen men were working on the tank when the fire erupted, but there are no reports of injury. Charles Schnitzer, Action Floor at the Belle Isle Power Plant. Discharge my duties as a justice as a justice of the Oklahoma Supreme Court of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. The State Court. House chamber was filled to capacity for the swearing in of Oklahoma's first woman justice to the Supreme Court this morning. Justice Alma Wilson was appointed to the High Court by Governor George Nye to replace Justice Ben Williams, who died last month. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Justice. Governor Nye told the assembly that Oklahoma has reached a historic point. This has been termed historic. And I would like to correct the reason of it being historic. Some people feel that this appointment is historic because Justice Wilson is the first lady to be appointed. I think it's more historic to point out that because she was not overlooked, she was able to be appointed. And so rather than say that we have appointed the first woman and create that a great step forward, I would like to say we've arrived at the time where women should not be denied consideration or appointment, and that is the historic event today. Congratulations. Justice Wilson was serving as chief district judge in Cleveland County before her appointment to the Supreme Court. She is aware of her place in Oklahoma history, but she accepts it lightly. That I resist the urge to respond to any whim of personal judgment or personality. That I impartially follow the law wherever it takes me. And that I have the courage to press for change with, with when it is necessary in order to preserve the law to reform it. When Justice Wilson takes her seat at this conference table, it'll be a new, unexpected turn in the road for her. She says she never dreamed she'd be on the Supreme Court, and right now she'll just work at being the best Supreme Court justice she can be, and not set any new, higher goals. Charles Schnitzer Action for at the Supreme Court.
most of them come back. As we reported yesterday, the Human Services Department claims some of the information in the Gannett News Service reports was secured illegally. That charge made by Executive Secretary George Miller. Today, Director Lloyd Rader confirms the charge. He points to a recent phone call he had from a man who claims he broke into the department and rifled through the files. That I came in and took pictures of documents. And my conscience is bothering me. Well, we get lots of anonymous calls, you know, on all kinds of subjects. But uh, naturally, we set up a little uh, surveillance and the Xerox machines, uh, the first two nights we had surveillance, uh, the, there was on one machine, the one just directly outside my office, I believe it was 111 copies, wasn't it, John? Yes, sir. Right. On the other end of the hall, down in the legal division, 76. These copies could not have been run off by some of your employees? No, the, the indicates they were run sometime between 3 and 5 o'clock. In the morning. morning? Yes, sir. You feel then that information was in print it and broadcasted that could yes. not have been secured legally? It, that is correct. After the interview, a consulting attorney said the Human Services Department will prosecute any employee, former employee or intruder who may have illegally supplied confidential information. Larry Otis, Action 4, Human Services Department. The jury in Major County Commissioner William Boston's kickback trial could not reach a verdict last week. But after three hours of deliberation today, Boston listened as he was found guilty on all 55 counts in the kickback scheme. The maximum penalty Judge Luther Eubanks can impose is a 375-year prison sentence and a $117,000 fine. Defense attorney Gene Stipe does plan to appeal the decision and was not in court today for the verdict. Assistant U.S. Attorney Bill Price says one of the counts was thrown out because of a technicality. And he feels Boston's own testimony is what hurt him. Well, I think Mr. Boston's testimony itself was, uh, was not believable. And uh, I felt like that uh, all through the trial, the witnesses were very credible and very believable. And they were doing, uh, they were trying to, to make up for the wrongs that they had done in the past. And uh, Mr. Boston chose to be in trial here today. And uh, uh, he could have... Uh, uh, sought to make up for what he had done in the past. The U.S. Attorney's Office was especially happy with this conviction because it showed they could get a conviction on testimony alone and didn't have to depend on tape conversations of alleged kickbacks. As for formal sentencing, that won't come until later. But the prosecution says it will be happy with whatever the judge decides. Ed Stewart, action for the federal courthouse. Medicine Park. Peaceful little Medicine Park is on the edge of the Fort Sill military base, nestled in a rocky valley of the Wichita Mountains. And just on the other side of that Wichita Mountain is a group of men playing a not so peaceful game. Those men back there are playing with their tanks. Actually, they are students learning how to handle the big guns. It's part of a training exercise, and somebody out there this morning flunked. What they are aiming at is this deserted hill, and most of the time they hit it. But about 9.30 this morning, some GI probably didn't have his sights on straight. At least, that's the military's excuse, and it's a good one, since why would anyone want to shell the town of Medicine Park? One errant shell did find its way into town and exploded. You'd think something like that would be easy to find, but it wasn't. No one could tell us where it hit. No one, that is, until we found Missy Johnson. She knows where it fell because it almost no, fell into her living room. I didn't think any more about it. I just sat there and kept having my coffee, and then my husband come running in the door, and I said, boy, that was close, wasn't it? He said, it sure was. It was right on the hill behind the house. I couldn't believe it. 
There are houses and businesses all around the hill, but Missy told us there wasn't anything on top of interest except the old Easter pageant shrine and the hole left by the shell. So we decided we'd better go and have a look. On the way up, Missy told us Army officials had already been up there and come down again with fragments, but they don't know who fired the round or what size it was, and Missy herself was having trouble finding the hole it left behind. It was a 20-minute climb up a rugged Wichita mountain, but before long, there it was, the crater. I thought it would be a lot deeper than that, but it must have hit an awful big rock, look. Yeah. From all these pieces here. Yeah, it looks like it and must have shattered it. uprighted some little uh, uh, roots and things there, but I thought it'd be a real deep hole and everything. It probably would have looked different had it landed in someone's breakfast, but fortunately the only victims were some rocks, dirt, and a tree that looked like it could use a merciful blow. Missy Johnson says she's never heard of shells falling in Medicine Park before, and if she has to climb up a mountain to show newsmen where they land each time, she hopes she never hears of it again, and so do we. Hey Ted, you sure this is the way back to the car? Most land surface owners do not own the mineral rights for whatever may be beneath their property. And under law, they have very few rights when a drilling company comes in to drill for oil or gas. If a farmer or rancher isn't satisfied with a settlement for damage to their property, they have to go to court, a time-consuming route that is rarely cost-effective. State legislators want to change that and make the oil boom a winning proposition, or at least not a losing one, for land owners that before upon entering this surface land or the owner, they have to contact both the surface owner and or the leasee uh, and that they try to negotiate. If they negotiate and come to an agreement on, on what the damages will, will be and, and all, then there's no problem. The operator goes on the, uh, the property and, and commences the drilling and and uh, everybody's satisfied. If they do not agree, then what they, he just goes to the district court, he puts up a $20,000 bond at the present time under the, the way the bill is now. Charles Schnitzer action for at the state capitol. A drink a day keeps the mortician away. That may become the boast of some social drinkers. A recent medical study shows that moderate drinkers who down two ounces of alcohol a day 
have less chance of dying from heart attacks than do non-drinkers, ex-drinkers, or heavy drinkers. Some social imbibers have maintained for years that a nip a night is good for you. Now they have scientific evidence to back up their claim. When the higher faculties in the brain begin to go a little bit, you can relax. Essentially, your worries, which are mostly psychological effects, sort of become less important and it allows you to relax. This is the same thing as when you get a tranquilizer. It's a tranquilizing effect in a way. The result is that your blood pressure will fall. A lot of your other faculties will just slow down a bit and you don't get the world coming in on you as fast as it is. You might think if two drinks a day are beneficial, then 10 shots a day would be even better for you. But medical experts say that isn't so. Daily overindulgence could lead to liver or kidney problems and could actually increase your chances of suffering a heart attack. Scott Wallace, Action 4. I, I was a little bit perturbed in reading about abuse at Helena that it wasn't pointed out that the only fatality at Helena was a state worker, one of the employees up there who was murdered. You might have read about the laundress up there who was murdered, raped and murdered by one of the little darlings in that institution. The big cost, of course, is the result of the delay for 30 days and what happens to the increased price of building and construction. And if inflation continues to go at 1% a month in the construction industry, then on a $32 million bond issue, you could be talking as much as $300,000 by the delay of one month. Or even if inflation were half that, uh, you're still talking about a sizable amount of money, $150,000.